we were going to do one last drug deal, it kind of went went badly. One of the guys was yelling, just kill him now. And the other one says, no, we got to get the rest of the drugs. Now let's just torch the place. You haven't felt anything till you felt the cold steel of a sawed off shotgun against your neck. I'm an unlikely person to believe in Jesus. I grew up going to my grandparents' home and, and seeing pictures of relative after relative that had died at the hands of Hitler and in the Jewish mindset they had died at the hands of Christians. And I felt like Jesus and Christianity was, was my enemy. I was raised in a traditional Jewish home in New York City. I was bar mitzvahed at 13, went to synagogue Friday and Saturday. I love Jewish history. I love reading uh, the Jewish Bible. I love being Jewish, but I wasn't really sure about the religion. And so I ended up going to college and ended up dropping out of college. And then my friend Ephraim Goldstein and I went all the way to the West Coast. Ephraim and I joined uh, his brother, uh, Baruch, and his friend, uh, Jan Moskowitz. And uh, so it was the Goldstein, Moskowitz, and Glazer. Sounds like a law firm. But uh, we, were, we were all there in uh, San Francisco, and we built a houseboat. All I can say is that it floated, but it wasn't pretty. And uh, we built it with drug money. I am contracted with this guy to, to buy some uh, marijuana. Unfortunately, he wasn't really going to buy the marijuana, he was going to steal it. He and his friends had sawed off shotguns and handguns and they tied us up. My whole life was, was in front of my eyes. One guy said, just kill him, just kill him. And the other guy said, no, let's just torch the place, let's just burn it down. And I'm just sitting there with my hands tied and feeling the shotgun saying, I can't believe that I was willing to die for just a few hundred dollars. One of our friends who dropped out of college with us moved to California for a little while and then she disappeared. And during the time she disappeared, uh, we kind of tore down the houseboat, moved into San Francisco. And uh, one day she appeared. She kept telling us that uh, she had found God and that she had found Jesus and that the end of the world was coming. And I thought she was nuts. I thought she was Meshuggah. Ephraim kind of listened to her and, oh, that sounds pretty good. So the next thing I know, they both went up to Oregon, and I felt because I was raised a more traditional Jew that I could help them. So I went up to this Christian commune in Coos Bay, Oregon. I was gearing up for a fight, but they just wanted to be nice and smile all the time, so I didn't trust them at all. We were sitting at the, at the table, about 20, 25 people, country food, blackberry cobbler baking in the oven. Then all of a sudden, um, Everybody kind of like fell asleep. Their heads went down. And then they all started holding hands. And I thought that was the strangest thing in the world. I thought it was just gonna be a seance. The old guy who was running the place, who kind of looked between a, an Amish guy and a Hasidic guy with, with a long beard, he just began talking up into thin air. For a minute I thought he was talking to me, but I realized when he called me Lord that it wasn't me. I'd never heard anybody pray as if they were actually talking to God, and it was just striking for me. You know, I'd been belligerent, I'd been angry, and then all of a sudden everything was kind of melting away because I sensed this presence in the room, and I began feeling smaller and smaller and smaller. You could almost touch it, it was palpable, this presence. And if there's one thing I never experienced growing up in a more religious Jewish home, was this intimacy, this, this personal contact and relationship with God. And I just knew that this was the presence of God, and, and that changed me. Well, I got back from Oregon, and all I could think about was God and about Jesus. I said, God, if you're really there, show me. I was working in the Redwood Forest, and uh, one night, uh, I needed to make a phone call. I went down to uh, the phone booth, and I was kind of staring at the redwood trees because I'm very fidgety, and one of these moonbeams just kind of fell on the ledge where there should have been a phone book, and it was, it was, it was almost like it was glowing, and there, right there on that, on that ledge of the phone booth was, was a little book. I looked through it, and it said Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I honestly didn't know who these people were, and I started looking at it, and, I, and there in small print it said, Modern English Version of the New Testament. I had asked God if he was real and how to get to him. Now I'm standing there with the New Testament glowing in the moonlight. I mean, what would you do? So I stole it. 
Well, I knew that God had left that New Testament there for me. And so I, I picked it up and began reading it, and I read it, read it over the next uh, few days. I read almost the whole thing. And, you know, I, I still expected Christians to be anti-Semitic and Jesus to be sort of the, the fountain of anti-Semitism. And the, the more I, I read, I realized Jesus was actually Jewish. And I knew that he was the Messiah that our, our people were waiting for, that I was waiting for. One of the things I love the most about the New Testament was the, the way Jesus told stories. I felt like he was a, a street smart New Yorker. I mean, he never answered a question simply. He always got to the heart of the matter. And you know, you always saw pictures of Jesus on the cross and he always looked so helpless, you know? But, but I met a very strong, powerful Jesus in the New Testament and I was very drawn to him. When I accepted Jesus, I was, I was looking for the truth and I knew that he was the truth. But I don't think I was looking for the truth about myself. I remember the day I realized I had sold drugs to teenagers. I was horrified at my, at my own soul. I, I don't think I understood enough about my own sin. I just began weeping and, uh, and repenting and asking God to forgive me. And then it took me a while, really, to even feel that, that God had forgiven me. I realized that believing in Jesus involved believing that he died for my sin. And throughout the years, I've just discovered that my life is the best way to demonstrate to my family and friends that I love them, I love God, and I love my people.